Joining us now to talk about the mess that is the New York City mayoral race this year is Ross Barkin. He is a contributor to The Nation, wrote a fantastic piece there we're going to talk about. He's also author of a brand new book out today, The Prince, Andrew Cuomo, Coronavirus, and the Fall of New York. Timely stuff. Um, congrats on the book, Ross. Great to see you. Good to see you, Ross. Thank you, and thank you for having me. A very crazy day in New York City, and also the release of my book still. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Big <laughs> you day for you, man. You timed you, that man. perfectly yeah. to make sure it dropped on a low-key day where you could really focus on it. So g good job there. Um, I want to ask you about the book, actually, but first just break down for us. For people who haven't been immersed in the details of this mayor's race, which has like completely gone off the rails, who are the main players? What's the state of the race? Who's the front runner? What have the contours been like? Sure. So right now there are four Democrats who all have some shot at winning. The front runner in the polls for the last month has been the Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams, and he's been followed by different candidates at different times. Originally, Andrew Yang, the uh, celebrity former presidential candidate, was the front runner. He no longer is. You have Maya Wiley, who's the Blasio's former counsel an MSNBC pundit, and you have Catherine Garcia, who was de Blasio's former sanitation commissioner. And there was a fifth candidate who was once one of the top contenders, Scott Stringer, but he was accused of sexual assault. The allegation was never substantiated, but that really derailed his campaign. So there's really four contenders. Adams is the favorite. Three of them are running explicitly. I would, I would define them as moderates, and one, Wiley, is kind of opposite occupying this left liberal lane, but certainly most of the candidates are talking about you know issues like crime, public safety, are pro-charter school, and um, have come out explicitly against the funding of the police. So very interesting race coming off of what happened in 2020. Yeah. And so, Ross, you wrote this piece, let's put it up there on the screen, um, in The Nation, which I saw get some play. We were talking a little bit about how Eric Adams in particular, who has been really kind of a strange figure who uses identity politics um, in order to cover for some of these corporate things that he's doing. Could you just explain that a bit? Yeah, so Eric Adams, he, he has fascinating political history. He was a police captain for a long time. He was in the transit police on the NYPD. He was elected to the state Senate and then to the relatively power, powerless perch of our president. He would be the, bur the city's second black mayor and he is someone who is both very anti-woke, I would say, in terms of he talks a lot about, um, you know, public safety and crime and being tough on crime. He said he carried gun on him if he uh, was elected mayor because he can legally do that. He has a history of making very incendiary statements. He once told uh, people who are from out of town, so-called gentrifiers, to go back to Iowa. Um, at the same time, <laughs> identity politics. So. I don't know if, that, if that's like the little woke side of him or it's more just kind of a classic cynical ploy, but repeatedly throughout this campaign and throughout his political career, he has used race as a way to deflect whether um, talking about tenant protection as an attack on black wealth, even though real estate developers and landlords are almost exclusively uh, very wealthy white people um, or these kind of large corporate firms um, and also you know saying he can... Uh, you know, illegally use these parking placards because the last former president got to do it. He was white. So you can't have corruption for the white guy, not for the black guy. So he's, mm. he's a very handy and incendiary figure, a little bit like Rudy Giuliani, maybe more left wing Rudy and even tiny shades of Trump. But I don't like to liken anyone to Trump, but he's definitely someone who makes a lot of outrageous statements and it can be very hard to keep track of all of them. I mean, he's really weaponized race in what is a disgraceful um, manner in this campaign and has been called out by, you know, Maya Wiley. And certainly some of his attacks have been on uh, Yang and Catherine Garcia, who kind of teamed up together. They campaigned together, including on Juneteenth. Um, Eric Adams tried to pretend like that was some racial affront yeah. and they were trying to disenfranchise black voters. He likened it to horrific legacy of the Jim Crow South and poll taxes. I mean, that's how aggressive he's been in essentially using these identity politics terms and the very real scourge of racism to cover for what is essentially a like corporate 
police state agenda. You had this paragraph in your piece that I think is really important because it takes it out of the context of just the New York City mayor's race and poses a larger question for the left. You say, for a long time, many on the left have favored an identitarian politics over one that aligns class with race. If identity is elevated above class and critiques of capitalism no longer matter, politicians like Adams will be emboldened. As a black man, he's been able to effectively denounce calls for greater tenant protections on the grounds they would adversely affect minority landlords while rebuking all criticism of, uh, criticism of himself as a racist. Um, as racist, so he's basically saying, like, if you're critiquing me, then you must be racist, no matter how legitimate the critique is. His supporters have attacked ranked choice voting itself, erroneously claiming that it weakens the power of non-white voters. So again, this is a guy who is basically cynically exploiting some of the, you know, well-intentioned proclivities of a lot of people on the left to position himself as a progressive while his ideals and what he stands for is anything but. Yeah, so I, I think Adams poses a unique danger to the left if he wins, and it looks like he may very well win because he has a lot of the populist rhetoric, and he's someone who would come in with a real populist coalition, working class blacks and Latinos, labor unions, these kind of dying outer borough political machines. And he could say on one hand, credibly, I was elected by the people. But unlike sort of, you know, left populist type politicians, there will be no large redistributive agenda, right? Eric Adams is backed by, like Andrew Yang, it is supported by, you know, billionaire charter school supporters, billionaire real estate developers. The city's power elite are very excited about Eric Adams. They might be a bit wary because he is unpredictable and incendiary. They prefer someone like Michael Bloomberg, who, you know, very much fit in, in a box, whereas Adams used to be a Republican, now he's a Democrat, he's all over the place. But fundamentally, he's not a challenge to capital. He's not a challenge to the power elite. At the same time, he's very adept at invoking race and making it seem like he himself is some kind of underdog or, or some kind of populist, like a lot of canny politicians. So challenging him, organizing against him will be difficult in my eyes because he has a strong coalition and he's very good at using these weapons of identity against the left. That's why I'm always warning my friends on the left, you really have to pair the class critique with race. Otherwise, you get this kind of woke capitalism, which is what Eric Adams ultimately represents. So Ross, do New York City progressives, how are they going to square that uh, working class blacks are likely to elect a black mayor who wants more cops and doesn't want to defund the police? I just feel like this has to be one of the biggest reckonings for what's happening with left politics in New York City right now. I'm curious for your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I would like to see that reckoning. So after the 2020 election, you know, I and some other people on the left were saying, look, you know, in New York City, Trump grew his vote share in working class Latino neighborhoods, and then to a lesser extent in working class black neighborhoods, he did not really grow his share in white neighborhoods. And this was true nationally. This really followed national trends. Mm -hmm. And I was waiting for like the professional left reckoning with that. And it just never came. I, I think unfortunately, a lot of these kind of NGO type groups, you know, they really have incentives to ignore what's going on. So you have, you have this, these weird scenarios where you know, a, a nonprofit NGO organization will say, we speak for the working class. Meanwhile, the working class is voting a certain way. I, I yeah. think there are smarter, cannier groups like DSA, but still there is this disconnect and the reckoning has not come. Yeah, yeah and point. even the like left candidate in the race now, Maya Wiley, the only marginally progressive person who has a shot, I mean, she was like on MSNBC every day opposed to Bernie Sanders. So and Scott Stringer, who was the other one, was also like, you know, a Hillary Clinton type progressive, I guess. Um, so the left really didn't have much of a showing in this race or anyone to root for whatsoever. Um, look, we don't know what's going to happen. And ranked choice makes this very dicey in order in order to effectively predict what's going to happen in this race. First time having ranked choice voting in the New York City mayoral primary. Um, but Andrew Yang was once solidly at the top of this field and has really fallen off to where, you know, I think if he were to win at this point, it would be a tremendous comeback. He's a, a large underdog at this point. What happened that caused him to fall off in the polls to that significant amount? So my theory is Andrew Yang 
really lost educated liberal voters. Unlike mm. the national Democratic electorate, the left liberal PMC part of the Democratic electorate in New York City is a lot bigger. So, you know, Elizabeth Warren flopped on the national stage, right? I think an Elizabeth Warren type candidate could do a lot better in New York City just because this kind of, you know, wealthier, affluent type Democrat who consumes a lot of news and, and has a graduate degree matters, right? You really can't win the mayorality being entirely shut out by them. And, and my theory so far is that despite their revulsion towards Eric Adams, they're more accepting of Eric Adams because he's been an elected official. His gaps take on a different quality. Andrew Yang really came in with a lot of energy and excitement. He just has shown a real knowledge gap around certain issues. He's gotten a lot of media scrutiny. It, Eric Adams did not really get any media scrutiny until I would say around May of you know 2021. Mm. Um, mm. And it's almost entirely absent from the media. It's very strange to even see this, whereas Andrew Yang, wall-to-wall -wall coverage, I think ultimately that hurt him. I think if Eric Adams got the level of scrutiny Yang did, he would not be so high in the polls. That being said, I think Andrew Yang did a really poor job of mitigating the fears of progressives and also at least trying to assuage some of this kind of educated liberal voter base, which mm. does matter. Bill de Blasio won with educated liberals, he won with working class black voters. Eric Adams will not do well with educated liberals, but my own sense is he's probably better positioned in ranked choice voting to show up on their ballots more mm. than Yang. That's still yeah. be Still Yang listened to those. Uh, Yang listened to those consultant, those Bloomberg consultants a little too much, I think. Um, tell us about the book. Congrats on it coming out today. Again, it's called The Prince Andrew Cuomo Coronavirus and the Fall of New York. We've certainly been talking to you about these topics for a while. What is it that you wanted to dig into in this book and expose about Andrew Cuomo and his uh, reign as governor there? So I really see this book as a rejoinder to the propaganda memoir he put out last year. The focus mm -hmm. of late mayor's race, but Andrew Cuomo is still the king of New York. He has not resigned. He's inordinately powerful. He wants to run for a fourth term. So this is a book about the horrible year of COVID in New York State. It's about how Andrew Cuomo failed New York, how he downplayed COVID, compared it to the flu like Donald Trump did, was late to respond, mismanaged nursing homes, courted scandal and controversy. And it's also about its political history. So if you're interested in kind of how Cuomo came to be who he is, how he betrayed the left over and over again, and really worked to foil the ambitions of Democrats. This is definitely a book for you. It, it's pretty, it's very readable. It's fairly short. And if you really, you know, you read the memoir last year or ignored the memoir last year and you mm. want to really find out what happened with Andrew Cuomo, what happened with COVID, who is this guy, why is he so powerful? I really think uh, this is a book you will enjoy and you should go buy it from Four Books today. I'm awesome. going to go ahead and assume our audience did not read the Andrew Cuomo <laughs> memoir. However, they should read your book because you have been the most astute observer, one of the most astute, astute observers, certainly, of Cuomo and his failures from the very beginning. You weren't buying into the media hype. Um, you've had already a lot of journalistic revelations that have been important, and you're an incredible writer. Everybody, we're going to put the information for the book down in the description so you can find it. Definitely check it out. Um, again, Ross, great to have you. Thanks for joining us on this spectacularly busy day for you. Thank you, Ross. Thank you for having me. Of mm -hmm. course. Thanks, everybody, for watching, guys. We really appreciate it. As a reminder, if you want to watch the full show completely uncut, you can become a premium member today. You get to listen to it as a full audio show as well, and you get to help support our work here. We're 100% powered by Supercast. We love them. It's an awesome partnership, and we will see you all on Thursday. Have a great day, guys. We'll see you back here on Thursday. Enjoy.